Welcome to the Pazic Performance Group Podcast. I am Tyler Pazic, and today we have Nick McKee on the pod pod. So Nick McKee is the head baseball coach at Piscataway High School in New Jersey and also the head coach of the summer collegiate team, the Ocean Gulls, which is an MLB-funded ACBL summer collegiate league. I'm excited to have Nick on the pod pod today, so let's get into it. What's going on, Nick? Going on, Todd. Thanks for having me, man. No problem. I'm excited to get into a lot of this mental skill stuff because I know that you've been doing it for quite a few years now and at the high school level um, and then also at the collegiate level with your summer team. I, I actually used to coach a summer team as well, which was probably the most fun I've ever had coaching, especially uh, after we introduced the mental game to our team which after the first year we had a super talented team but then we get into the playoffs and we lose the first round of the playoffs and I'm like this ain't happening again so I went out and I figured out I I like learned from Brian Kane who you also worked with and we came back the next year and not only did we absolutely dominate the league but we went in and we played our butts off in the playoffs and won. We actually, our first day of the playoffs, it was an 18 playoff single elimination. First day got canceled. So we had to play three games on Sunday and, you know, three games in a day is a grind for anybody. And yeah, yeah, we just, we dominated and came out with this, with the championship. And it all, I believe had to do with the adoption of the mental game into our team. So anyways, uh, one of the, one of the things that I'm interested in, as always, is accountability. So I know this might be out of left field, but what's one way you build accountability into your team? Thoughts, actually. <laughs> Just from left field, man. Starting off with a toughie. Um, you know, obviously, as an educator and, and, and a high school coach, man, you're going to get a different, bunch of different personalities, and accountability is going to be different different you know for a kid that's a freshman a sophomore junior all the way up to senior year and I tell them a lot and it's it's, I'm not trying to throw BS but our goal is to make them employable at the end of the day and if they starts with some self-accountability then that could be huge so what we did this year was for the first time we started lifting and doing team lifts at 6 a.m before school um you know three days a week and we're gonna bump it up to four as we're getting closer to the season but to start building that accountability there. And I can't make it mandatory for these kids to come in and lift at six o'clock in the morning, but you know, our numbers are, are, we're pretty strong. And I think getting them used to, you know, a lifting program where they're, they're held accountable and they're not necessarily doing it themselves, but they got to get there and get through the program for the day, which for a high school kid, that, that's, that's kind of, you know, unheard of these days. And are you there every morning? It's rough, man. You know, I'm about <laughs> I'm 53 miles from school, so on on lifting days, I'm up at like 4:30 to get oh here by gosh. six. So the weight room gets open, man. So it, that's it, amazing. It's, well, so they're seeing you show up, up as well there in the morning. Exactly. Yeah. So they they see me show up, and then I have two other coaches that'll show up there too. So accountability is huge in that aspect. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's yeah. kind, of, kind of accountability with the coaching staff, and then. To get these kids three days a week to show up at 6 a.m. before school starts at 7 is, mm-hmm. you know, it's been huge. Yeah, one question that I've, that I've actually been pondering over quite a bit lately is how do you get a kid to do extra work if, like, on his own work if he doesn't do it? Like, wh- what is something that you can do to show him that he needs that extra work and that he should be in by himself getting his work in on his own? And I think – my answer to that question has been to show him the way and do it as well. Show up to the weight room and get your extra work and be like, Hey, I'm showing up here at this time to work out. Like I'd love if you could make it as well. And then it's on them, but you're showing them the way and you're saying, Hey, like get in here. If you want to get better, if you want to be great, if you want to help this team win in the spring, then you need to get in and work out. I'll be there. Like hopefully you can come too. And I think it's, I, I think that's, that's the way to do it. You have to, especially at the high school level, you have to show them Dude, uh, the way. It's, it's, well, we use uh show the way, know the way, go the way here. Ooh, I like that one. So show the way, know the way, go the way. And like I said, just 
I think them seeing the coaching staff show up that early, you know, that, that's where we're trying to build that trust and that relationship. So when the season starts, it's only my second year here. You know, I'm trying a lot of new things. I'm planning on trying a lot of new things this season. But they, they see me doing it. The trust gets built. And then so when something's suggested to them during practice, hopefully they'll take it and run with it. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of expecting the people that were lifting every day. There, there's some kids in there that haven't missed a day. So, uh, you know, not just those kids, but to take a suggestion and, and work with it, whether it's getting extra dry swings or, you know, getting some towel drills done off the mound, just simple stuff. Mm-hmm. What's one of the new things that you're implementing? Uh, just, uh, I would like everybody just to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about breathing a little bit, and that kind of rolls into the accountability question as well, because I was asking you, how do you get them to take the breath and become, like, make that breath a part of their regular routine? Yep. So we, we saw it last year. We made it kind of a magical run in our county tournament here. So we end up getting to the semifinal. We're at a big stage. We're playing at Rutgers University against a, a good South Brunswick team. And all of a sudden, I see, you know, we're rushing through things. And people just running up into the box. They're, they're not doing anything. Our pre-pitch routine defensively was just completely different. I got sophomores that actually look like sophomores, and they're looking like seniors the whole season. So to, to throw in, you know, just a simple breath exercise and – I know the Brian Kane stuff. You watch the majority of college baseball and even professional baseball. These dudes are picking out a spot in the bat and they're breathing every single time. They're doing the same thing. So trying to get a, a 14, 15 year old kid to do that, it's 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 been a challenge. So it's it's trying to build more consistency that way is, is my probably my number one goal this year. Yeah, and one of my questions for you was how do you get them to do it? over and over and over again and your the answer we were talking about that you said was that you literally pull them out of the cage if they don't take a breath and i'm like damn what do kids want to do when they go to baseball practice they want to swing the bat they want to throw the ball they want to pitch and when you take that away from them i'm pretty sure they're going to get in the box next time and just take a simple breath yep that's it man so i'll have them walk out and walk back in so we'll do a round um, maybe like our last round of 10 swings and it's the any, anywhere swings and they'll walk in, they'll walk out every single swing. And so they're, they're, they're doing that every time. So I'm just trying to establish that routine, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I think once definitely the first phase of a routine is taking a breath because we perform at our best when we're in a relaxed body, calm mind state. And in any sport, what I'm realizing is we play best in a relaxed body, calm mind state. Because when you're relaxed, you can be reactive. And when you're relaxed, you can be explosive. But a lot of people can't get into that state because they're so tense. And yeah. yet the breath helps with that. And then the second yeah. phase. That's, that's probably. Yeah, go on. What's that? Yeah, the, well, that's probably every, every mound visit I have. Uh, it, it's to take a breath and slow the game down, you know, because once everybody's all tense and, and going crazy, man, they don't understand that if you just breathe and fill up your stomach for a few, the game slows down, you're relaxed, and all of a sudden you you, you touched on it. You're just going to perform better. Yeah, you're present when yeah. you do that. Instead of thinking about the future, thinking about the past, you take a breath and you get present. And actually, I got a funny story about that when I was at Indiana State. This is the importance of training the breath outside of sport. So when I was at Indiana State, I was the first freshman out of the pen for us against Dallas Baptist. And we're down, we're down there in Dallas playing. I come out of the pen, I get onto the mound, and you know, I get out of that inning. Next inning I go out and I go, I get the first out, second out, and then ground ball to my second baseman, and he throws it to first except he doesn't throw it to first he throws it into the stands and so now we got a guy on second with two outs I wind up walking the next guy and then a little duck snort hit so now the bases are loaded and (laughs) next thing I know my coach is out there on the mound talking to me and he goes take a breath and I go and all of a sudden like I could feel my heart beating I noticed I was sweating I could feel the adrenaline pumping through my body. I'm like, 
whole and it freaked me out even more yeah because i became so present in the moment and he goes out he you know walks off goes back to them goes back to the dugout next at bat i throw an inside fastball to this lefty i thought i jammed him i thought it was a pop up to the left fielder so did my left fielder he's backing up backing up backing up all of a sudden his back runs right into the fence and it's a grand slam and uh, uh, i'm like oh <laughs> my gosh what a way to start my college career but that was that was me taking a breath and it got me super present but i hadn't trained that yeah. i've never been i feel like i had never been that present in my life before so that's the importance of yeah training the breath. Do you guys like meditate or do breath work before practice or after practice? Planning. Well, we got into yoga during football season and that was huge. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe I'll try to do that Saturday mornings if we don't have the game or, you know, definitely, definitely on off day. Um, I want to try to incorporate that at least once a week. So that, that's, that's been on the to-do list. We have someone that comes in here and uh, she's a yoga instructor and, you know, works with various sports teams. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, a quick, uh, another good way to like work in the breath is just at the beginning of practice, literally setting a stopwatch for two minutes and then just say, okay, close your eyes and concentrate on your breath. Feel your breath, focus and refocus. And what I always say is that success is not about your ability to focus, it's about your ability to notice you're distracted and refocus. So it's more like focus, refocus. And so when you're asking them to concentrate on their breath, whether it be in their stomach or maybe it's they feel it on their nostrils, then you can every 30 seconds say, okay, notice your thought and bring yourself back to your breath. And that's helping them build that awareness around how their brain is thinking and around their thoughts and able to release those and get back to what they want to focus on. So in a game, they might walk up there and what, like this is a, another awesome story I got from this high school player who is a senior this year, so hopefully he does well and gets to go play in college. But he, it was late game, man on first with one out, and that guy on first was the tying run. And he comes up to the plate. He goes like this, actually holds his bat out like this, looks at the pitcher's hat, takes a deep breath, comes up, and he noticed when he brought his bat up, he was thinking, don't ground it out to the shortstop. <laughs> and – so he noticed his thought, he steps out, he refocuses and says, okay, what do I want to do? I want to hit a line drive into the right center gap. So he gets back in, takes his breath, brings up his bat, and then, of course, he hits a line drive. It was up the middle, but that would have been cool if it was right center. Yeah, man. And, like, again, that's him catching his thoughts and being aware of his thoughts so that he can actually make a change. Yeah. And that, that's that's – so far for me been the toughest thing because you're not going to find a lot of kids that can do that right now. Like, like I said, at 14, 15. So that's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And that's, that's also the importance of connecting. I think the first step is what, what we were talking about, the breath. And then the second step is getting them to use the breath as a mental checkpoint to check in with themselves. You know, like, am I in control yeah. of myself? Am I not in control of myself? And when you actually take the time to take that breath, then you can process and get into a rational state and then make a decision and move forward. Hopefully you're thinking about what you do want to do instead of what you don't want to do. For sure. For sure. So, um, so you guys do the breath in practice and you actually pull them out of the cage. What's, what's another thing that, you think differentiates your program from other programs? Um, just the, it really, really depends. I think right now with, with the whole lifting thing, that kind of set us apart because we started so early and getting people to, you know, sustain that the whole, the whole winter. And it, it, it's been, it's been tough um, breathing. Absolutely. And working, you know, defensively too. Um, well, more, more breathing. <laughs> I, so you were talking about your your defensive routines that you do with them. Uh -huh. Can you walk me through that? Because I'm always interested in routines, and defensive routines don't get talked about very much. Yeah, well, well, you know, I don't know how much it's going to play into the, the mental aspect, but I like to do the same thing over and over every day. Um, you know, so we'll go over our first and thirds, our bunt defenses. Obviously, in the beginning of the season, we're going to spend – um, about 20, 20 to 30 minutes on each and could be more. 
that and some triangle pop-ups too because that's an absolute epidemic at every level of baseball going from little league high school college and then professional um you know we'll get our, our communication stuff down and then we'll just get into our mass reps every single day no matter what we're doing we're always taking time to get some mass reps uh corner guys working together uh, dudes up the middle um catchers doing their stuff but <clears throat> i i think that that routine and kids especially at this level you know you can't just go out there and line kids up anymore it's not going to do it man um everyone's going to move and all they want is just a routine you know and i feel like we perform pretty well when we're everything's working and moving along what's the reasoning behind doing mass reps all the time just that that muscle memory man because we're giving them every sorts every sort of uh every sort of ground ball fly ball you know whether it's a slow roller they're throwing on the run they're changing arm angles um you know we'll 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 step it up a little bit and you know once we throw some base runners in to get some situational stuff and you know trying to take them to a really tense situation in practice you know it's tough to do in baseball um but i i just think that the more they do something it's going to become routine like there's the word again mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mass reps are, I think, I don't hear that talked about enough, I feel like, because it's at any level, you need those reps, you need just the quantity to yeah ingrain that pattern into your body and into your mind so that you can become more repeatable. And if you talk to any elite pitching coach or any elite hitting coach, they all say, how do you, how do you become great? Or how do you become consistent? You repeat the feel. Or how do you become inconsistent? You you repeat a bad feel. <laughs> like once you find that, once you get down to that feel, though, what it's like to, you know, come out of your hand or the way your body moves and the sequencing behind swinging the bat. Once you can repeat that, then you can actually become consistent. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, then even the mental consistency. Um, with all the first and thirds and, and bunt situations and PFPs and stuff too. If you don't do that every day, in my opinion, it's going to go, you know, balloon theory. The balloon's going to be filled up one day and then you take a couple of days off, that balloon's going to pop, mm. you know? So doing it over and over again, you know, so if PFP, your, your pitcher's taking the right route and that ball's not going to hit him and go up the right field line, he's going to get now. You're not going to have to think about it. Mm -hmm. I like that. Have you ever read the talent code? No, I've not. Daniel Coyle wrote this book called The Talent Code, and it's all about ingraining habits inside of inside of your brain, basically, and ingraining greatness in your muscle memory. But he talks about how when you're doing things like that, doing it on a smaller field, and your brain uh, is a class over. <laughs> Half lunch is over. Half lunch is over. Half lunch is over. Get into the next one. <laughs> But, and uh, so he talks about doing it on a smaller field, though. And, he, and then he talks about the greatest soccer players in the world, how when they were growing up, they would play soccer on a field that's half the size with a ball that's half the size, but also twice the weight. Yeah. So uh, it was very similar, but it, the game moved so much faster. And I remember actually at Indiana State, the year that we were the best at bunt d's and first and thirds and stuff like that was the year that all the pitchers when we worked on our stuff we would work on it our pfps and everything like that on a smaller field so we would take the bases and shrink them down to like 30 feet and then practice that way and that way we could get those mass reps and not not only are you you're able to practice at a faster speed as well because everything is smaller so you only have to take five steps to get to first instead of you know 15 or whatever it might be so I, th I think that is another great idea to like just shrink the yeah. to get those mass reps. Really? Uh, and so you were talking about how hard it is to get guys into that stressed state in baseball, you know, so where like they have to perform under pressure and practice and then that yeah. obviously transfer over to the game. You know, another sport that we were talking about is football. And I feel like at the football level, that's definitely a little bit easier to get guys into that stressed state. Do you, do you coach football as well? I do. I'm a quarterback coach here. Quarterback coach. So like 
how much easier is it or harder or the same to get a quarterback into a stress state versus a baseball player? Um, definitely much easier because, you know, he's going against, uh, you know, scout D all week and they're going to bring it. But, you know, we had a kind of a tough task this year because we had a quarterback go down and we had to figure out who was going to play quarterback four days before the start of the season. So it was, it was kind of tough. And this kid was a senior. He was a highly recruited receiver, our best defensive back too. And he kind of just selfishly, unselfishly put that all aside, took over. And he learned, you know, how to play quarterback. He hadn't played since sixth grade in four days. Oh my so, gosh. so I imagine, how, how, how'd imagine you guys, the stress of that. Yeah. How did you teach him? How'd you teach him the game that quick? Um, he's very knowledgeable, man. And we didn't start running any kind of check with me's or anything until like his third week, but he ended up going out there. And at one point in the season, he was like 17 for 17, one game. And he was just absolutely killing it. You know, it didn't always look pretty all the time, but he was able to get the job done, be an athlete and, you know, make, make most of the right checks and recognize coverages and all that. So it was, mm -hmm. it was pretty cool to see. What's a check with me? So you get the line of scrimmage, you're either running right or left. All right, so he'll read the backer, and, you know, he'll read their defensive line, and he'll make a call. So it's either 30, 31, one's right, one's left. That's it. Mm -hmm. Man, so he was making those calls three weeks in. Yep. Man, yep. dude. That's, I mean, it helped. that's pretty elite. It helped with his, yeah, it helped with his knowledge defensively, but it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So you guys have actually a, a mental skills guy on – on staff with the football Ew. team. Ew. So, so how does he implement the game? Or like, what's one thing you've learned from him this past year working at this high pictures. school? He loves taking pictures. So he'll, when I first started, so I was in, in August, we're up at, we call it green acres up at the top of the school. And that's where we practice. We don't practice on the turf. You know, we, we grind out in the, on the old dirt field over there. And, Get rid of that get, entitlement. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it, man. You know, you champions are the. Yeah, you know, we gotta go on it. We gotta go on an entitlement tangent here in a minute. But yeah, tell me about these pictures real quick. Yeah, so uh, it was my first day, and uh, I get a picture, and it's me and like three kids, and it was from a number I didn't know. He goes, "Oh, you Let know." Gavin, please come to attendance. When it Gavin to attendance. And for those for those listening right now, Nick is on lunch <laughs> at his high school, so that's why you keep hearing these dings in the background and these announcements. Hopefully, they don't, hopefully they don't call me. <laughs> so I, I get a picture with three kids around me, and his his reason being is I'm in the middle of a teaching moment, and he wants me to remember what I was saying and conveying to these kids at the time. Mm -hmm. So, and then throughout the season, I'm getting a whole bunch of texts from him like that, and. I would just I just never thought of doing anything like that or taking a picture of a moment. So, you know, it's wait, so does he say something like, does he take the picture and send it to you and be like, was this, was this moment worth remembering? Yeah, he, he, no, he, he doesn't. He just goes, remember what you were teaching here in this moment because the kids are locked in and whatnot. So oh, it, got you. Yeah. The kids were locked in. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. And you know, he, he helps mm. out because we have a, a bunch of different personalities in the school team, obviously. Um, and the biggest thing I took away this year, and this coaching staff for football is probably the best I've seen at the at the high school or even collegiate level. Um, they take everything into account with these kids, man, because at the end of the day, you don't know where they're living. Uh, you don't know if they ate breakfast. You don't know what's going on with family-wise. And it, it taught me to never assume, you know, one thing about a kid. So instead of getting frustrated, taking a genuine interest, having a conversation, the last one, <laughs> having a conversation and picking a brain. So before you freak out, you know, we found out we have a kid that's bouncing around from house to house, parents aren't around and, you know, the kid's struggling to eat. So maybe, maybe that's why he's, he's acting out or he's not performing or, you know, all these unsportsmanlike penalties are happening because there's no base at home. So, for him to be able to sit down with, with Jerry, the, the psych, is, you know, having him there and let these kids talk through stuff, it's, it's been huge. Man, what you just said is one of the things that I've noticed between mediocre coaches and elite coaches. Elite coaches seek curiosity before control. 
and you could talk about we can talk about this with accountability as well. Like when a kid messes up and you go to hold them accountable as their coach, do you seek curiosity first or do you seek control first? Because when you seek curiosity, then you can ask a couple of questions first. And that's, that's the thing that I've noticed with elite coaches. They go in and I say, how do you, how do you hold a kid accountable? And then they say, well, the first thing I do is I normally ask them a question or two thinking like, Hey, what was one thing that was going through your head in this moment? Or why did you go, why did you do this instead of that? And I'm like, man, they don't ever go in and just tell them what to do. They ask first and then tell second to get the kid's opinion and see where the kid's at mentally and how he's processing the event. So I think what you just said is absolutely crucial to being a great coach. Yeah, and well, and being on staff with them this year, like the head coach for football here, it's a, it's a storied program as far as um, this got ranked like top 10 program uh, over the last decade in Jersey. You know, between um, the NFL guys here, there, there's like 14 dudes in the last 12, 15 years, 12 to 15 years that are in the NFL. So we were turning out kids – left and right, winning state championships. The head coach is like a top 100 coach of all time, all sports in Jersey. So to, to be a part of that and to learn this year, it's definitely I'm – I'm taking so much stuff um, as far as dealing with the kids and even as far as the coaching staff and my expectations for both to the, to the baseball field. You know, I, I think it's, it definitely made me a better coach for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely huge. So that's, that's interesting that – you guys, one, have a, a sports like on staff that's, you know, few and far between, especially at the high school level. And then second, I think it's cool how he actually works with you guys and how he's out there on the field. Like a lot of sports psychs are just in their office all day waiting for people to come in and talk to them. So the fact that he's out there and snapping pics of you guys, getting different moments and capturing different moments in time. And also the camera never lies. You know, it's this, it works the other way too. I, I actually don't, film, don't lie. <laughs> the first time I went in and worked with a a team, this baseball team, I watched the coach speak to the team, and there were backs to him, like they were looking over their shoulders at him. They weren't facing him straight on. And what I did was I did the same exact thing. I snapped a picture, and I said, "Hey, man, like." you need to get their full attention by looking at this picture. Do you think that they are locked in and engaged with you? And of oh. course the answer was no. And so then from then on, it was face forward, eyes front, one voice. And so that's huge being able to have somebody there, an outside source to come in and kind of critique you and criticize you productively. Yep. Well, that, and he's always just, He's always just on the side, and he's never not listening or not watching anything. It's insane. So, I mean, he's retired, obviously. But for him not to miss a practice like that and to offer, you know, that type of service, nobody has that around here. It's insane. Yeah, that's, that's elite. And that's probably a big reason why you guys are as good as you are. Is my is my guess. Is my guess, anyways. But so you guys practice up on the dirt field. And – that is super interesting to me. Is that because of your, like, you guys have to earn the right to play on the turf? Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. man, that's, that's absolutely brilliant because that's one thing I've been thinking about a lot at some of the, especially at the bigger universities and even at any university that I go to, I'm like, man, they get the nicest stuff here. I'm like, when I was in college, I didn't get any of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And some, and I think about how everybody talks about entitlement nowadays and how kids are so entitled, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that is because we're enabling that. Yep. And so hopefully next year I can get a couple of coaches on board with me to like not let the guys go to the locker room until they earn the right to change in the locker room or strip away their – the the logo of the school they have to earn the right to play for oh yeah you know just because they signed a letter of intent and whatnot doesn't mean that they actually get to play so uh how do you guys how do you guys go about like making them earn it or what's one way you make them earn it um well obviously 
we're going to practice up there. So we start there in August. And the first time that we'll be on the turf field here is for the walkthrough, and that's it. So they're not touching the turf all week. Um, plain helmets, nothing, nothing crazy until literally week one. So even for our scrimmages, like we have old ratty practice jerseys they're going with. And, you know, here's one of the best teams in the state, but it, they're not having – like they don't have anything nice yet. You know, they have, their, their name's still on the front of the helmet. <laughs> so then the day before the first game, they'll start handing stuff out. So as far as decals and – and logo. What's the reasoning behind having the name on the front of the helmet? Um, just so you know who they are. Just so we know who they are, man. You know, <laughs> oh, I thought it was like to basically say like you're not like you're playing for yourself right now. And I don't yeah, know. I thought yeah. there was some analogy behind not it. Yet, not yet. Not yet. But um, that's man, that's good. good. Do you do anything like that enough. in baseball too? Um, I they won't get their hats. Or anything like that. They don't wear any of their new gear until the regular season starts. Um, so it's kind of figure it out on your own until then. Um, mm. You know, we're wearing gray pants, white pants, and a black p way shirt. That's it. So mm. nothing, nothing crazy. And then, um, you know, I'll give everybody a clip uh, at the beginning of the season, and we'll all link up at our. I do like a preseason um, uh, dinner type thing at a restaurant around here, and I bring in a motivational speaker. Um, so we'll we'll all link up and then we'll carry we'll carry the the fully the full link around with us the whole season. So I like wait, so like that. explain this link to me. Um, we just get a couple clips, and everyone that's on the team's got to clip theirs on, and you know I'll pick one senior captain to wear it around, and you know that's that's us the whole year. It's everybody involved in the team. So that's what and we're doing. Kind of like you're only as strong as your weakest link. That's it. And then that and is then, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. It's so, so simple. Yeah, it's so simple. So last year what we did was, you know, the guy that came in had the had the kids pick one word to write down. So what he did was what you want for the, it was something could be motiv was something motivational. So, you know, maybe it was focus, maybe it was talent. Um Every kid wrote it down, and then it was a piece of tape, and they linked it up with a piece of rope. So we had that all season, too, to look at. So we had that hanging in the dugout. So when some, you know, stuff was hitting the fan, you know, they could look up and see something positive, you know, maybe maybe bring it back. Mm -hmm. You know, our football, our football team's got focus across the, uh, across the helmet. So instead of, instead of the school logo, you get that. Focus. So they, you can, know, that is, in the that is of the so game, good. You know, they look at the guy next to him, and if something's, you know, hitting the fan, they look at someone next to him, and boom, they see focus. Mm -hmm. Bring it back, bring it back in. Yeah, that's that's good. It's retraining the mind so that your default mechanism is that one word, and so that like when things do hit the fan, what do you default to? Do you default to blaming def de blaming or complaining or defending, or do you default to focus, default yep. to attitude, and yep. things along those lines? So that's that's cool. So they all picked a one word a one word focus, and that's what they came back to over and over and over again throughout. Yeah. The yep. So, man, the link. Who gets to carry around the link? A uh, senior captain. A senior captain? Is there yeah. any – okay, so I was, I was just wondering if there was, like, a way that even, like, you could earn that kind of like a – kind of like how the White Sox had the home run chain. <laughs> yeah. Whoever hit the most recent home run, they got the they got the sweet White Sox chain around their neck. Yeah. That's, a, that's what I was wondering about. Like, one thing I've been thinking about, too, at the, at the baseball level is co-RBIs. So not a lot of, a lot, you know, a lot of guys in the stat book, they get down that they got an RBI on in their stats, but nobody ever really talks about the co RBI, which is if you say you have a guy on second with less than two outs and you hit a fly ball to right field and you move the guy from second to third, yeah, you don't get an RBI there, but you do get a co RBI if he scores, you know? So like, not only did that guy that, drove him in actually get the RBI but you get a co-RBI and I like so, that. 
that's that's one thing that I talked about actually in college like after guys would after guys would score a run or they would get the RBI instead of going and giving them a high five or not instead but I would go give them a high five and then I would go find the guy that helped us get that RBI in the first place and I'd be like yo dude sweet co RBI and I I give him a fist pump and I didn't even realize what I was doing at the time, but that's something that came back to me when I was talking to a coach. I think it was like two weeks ago. So it was pretty recent. Awesome. Like, Man, that was actually awesome. pretty brilliant of me. Yeah. <laughs> Pat on my back. <laughs> so I'd be, be, being fiercely humble right now. Um, but do you guys have values as a program as well? Like you guys had the one word focus. Do you guys have a one word focus for the program, kind of like the football team does? Um, not yet. Not yet, but, um, you know, I, I've been thinking about that, actually. And, you know, what I want this program to be based on, you know, obviously trust has got to be number one. Um, you know, trust between the coaching staff, trust between the players, the player-coach relationship, trust between the players as a whole. Um, love, too, man, and toying with that, you know, trust, love, and, uh, you know, I'm still kind of searching, so – Trust, love, communication, TLC. <laughs> oh, hey, yo, there you go. That's it. The, uh, yeah, trust is huge because I've, I heard this quote one time that when you build a bridge of trust, build a bridge of trust so strong that it can bear the weight of truth. So when guys are being honest with each other, if you've built that bridge of trust and they come and hold each other accountable – it will actually support that instead of you go in there and you try telling your teammate what to do. And they're like, who the hell are you telling me that? Yeah. Um, look at you. You don't, you don't do that yourself. How are you going to come to me and tell me to do what you're telling me to do? So like yeah, build a bridge of trust so strong it bears the weight of truth. I think that is a, br- that is a great value. And I'm, right, and I'm writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, and then defining it. What does because love, especially love, you know, like you you definitely need to define what that word means to the team because Absolutely. some people might see love and be like, Man, I like I don't it could be what I this is what I say about the word family. You know, some people will jump on a grenade for their family and then some people will throw a grenade at their family. Like oh, oh, family, yeah. so the definition of that word definitely needs to be needs to come into play, and that's a, that's one thing I actually ask a, a lot of people is is what's your definition of that word? Because my definition might be different from your definition, and I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here yeah. moving forward. So, yeah, let me keep me updated on those on those values. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. They got some good meanings behind it but i know uh you got to get running here pretty soon what is your number one takeaway from our little chat here today oh number one takeaway is that you know i do a lot but could be doing a lot more (laughs) (laughs) so what's what's one thing you're going to do a lot more of this based on what we talked about i think um building uh, just getting those values from my program to be honest even even though it's just the most recent thing we talked about and it's funny because I'm in, I'm in the health class right now so I'm out of the gym and we're talking about legitimately like an hour ago talking about values and whatnot so it's just funny that, that that's the thing that caught my attention right here what do you guys talk about in values in health class um you know how people's values differ uh, you're instilled by your family and you know, they, they could change over time. You know, someone's emotional health, if it's in a good standing, you know, your values are going to be pretty good. But if, if your emotional health's not taken care of, then that's completely different. William Andrew, please come to attendance. William Andrew, to attendance. Ooh, someone's in trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's that's awesome that you guys are talking about that there. Because when I took a – when I took a – it was – it was, it was a counseling class when I was getting my master's and it was the whole entire semester. We talked about values the entire yeah. time because yeah. they are, they're, they're so key to yeah emotional health, emotional fitness, and just like longevity in terms of yeah emotional health really. 
So yeah. clearly, just, clearly defining those. Yeah. So that that's definitely, you know, number one on the list. And then also just, you never know going to emotional health in, in, in athletics, um, going real, real quick back on what I was saying about getting to know your kids and whatnot, um, dealing, dealing with even just sports anxiety or, you know, anxiety a person has, it's, it's dealing with that in athletic level is a challenge too, man, especially in the weight baseball world. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, that I've talked about a lot with anxiety is that you're not necessarily an anxious person. You just had a moment of anxiety or like you just had a moment of anxiousness or like you could think about that with any real emotion, right? You're not an angry person. You just had a temporary moment of anger where you let the anger overtake for a moment. And a lot of, and a lot of people growing up, they're identified as, Oh, you're a shy person. Oh, you're an angry person. Oh, you're an anxious person. You're a nervous person. And it's like, no, you're not necessarily any of those. You're just, yeah. there are moments in time when you are that way. And yeah, exactly. just like with anybody. And that's the thing too, I think with kids is that they think that they're out here by themselves on this island. Like they're the only person in the world that's ever been had like a moment of being depressed or like a moment of being super anxious. And yeah. so it, it's normalizing that as well. Uh, so, and the, and the most elite coaches that I know are really good at understanding their emotions and being aware of their emotional thoughts and then acting differently than how they feel in that, that moment or choosing the way that they want to feel. I love acting differently than what you feel. That's a big Brian Kane spot right there. Mm -hmm. Actually, we were talking about Dr. Rob Gilbert who, yeah. uh, before we got on this call. We were talking about this guy, Dr. Rob Gilbert, who runs the success, the success hotline. And he talks about that all the time as well. I love it. Is um, act differently than how you feel. And actually his number is 973-743-4690 if you want to give the success hotline a call because he leaves a message on this phone number on this phone number every single day he's been doing it for over 25 years okay. what's the number it's it's 973-743-4690 uh -huh. today's message is good he talks about uh, the miracle on ice team because 40 years ago today is the day that they played the Russians, oh. not in the Olympics, but a couple the of scrimmage. weeks before, in the, the scrimmage. Scrimmage. Yeah, yeah. yeah, when they yeah. lost like 10 to three. Yeah, they got waxed. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then two weeks later, they, they yeah. won the gold medal against the same Wild. exact team. So it's a good message. Oh. But yeah, talk about consistency, commitment, discipline he's been literally leaving a message there that all relates to performance psychology for 25 years jeez man yeah absolutely it's wild remarkable all right well thanks for being on nick i appreciate it. i know you gotta get running over to what class are you heading to now oh freshman health man more freshman health. health yeah buddy more health today that's it <laughs> All right, we'll get after it. Thanks for being on. We'll be in touch. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, see ya. All right, be well.